Gabe Howard, host Inside Bipolar podcast and author of Mental Illness is an Asshole. Can you tell me a little bit about your own mental health journey? I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder in 2003, and it, it was it was startling to me. If you would have asked me an hour before I was committed to a psychiatric hospital where I was ultimately diagnosed, if I had a mental illness, I would have said absolutely not. And yet from this vantage point, now that I have a, a lot of education and a, and a lot of therapy and a lot of treatment, the warning signs were just gigantic. I mean, there were basically huge spotlights, laser lights, everybody screaming, oh my God, there's something wrong. And my family and I were like, no, he's good. He's good. That's that's fine. I just thought all of this was normal because, of course, I, I was born this way. So it was it was normal to me. So with uh, the podcast and also the book, uh, which I love the title, uh, Thank you. how does those outlets help your mental health? I, one of the most fascinating things about my career is that I am forced and I, I use the word forced on purpose. I am forced to dig deep. Nobody wants to hear the, the, the surface stuff. Like, oh, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and it was hard. Well, yeah, being diagnosed with an illness is hard or yeah. I, nobody wants to hear surface stuff. Like, you, you know, I, I, I thought about suicide, but then I got coping skills. And because of those coping skills and medication, I'm now in recovery. Yes. Those are all very, very good things, but those are very stereotypical things, yeah. right? I, I think everybody has some version of that story and, and that's fantastic, right? So people want the dark corners. They, they want to know about the fights with ex-wives. They, they want to know about the, the fractured relationships. They, they want to know what I was thinking when I was sitting in a corner and, 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 and crying for days on end. They want to know what mania feels like. They, they want a, a glimpse, not only behind the curtain, but behind that curtain and behind that curtain. So that's forced me to really introspectively and honestly evaluate those times to make sure that that I'm being genuine right because this is all about vulnerability me me lying or giving generic information is not going to help people so that forces me to really evaluate those moments it, it forces me to ask the people around you know it's one thing to say well I was estranged from my family right because I was but now I want to talk to my mom and be like hey how did you feel when I yelled, I hate you at you? And I think that many people with bipolar disorder, they don't get the opportunity to do that because they're like, you know what? We've moved on. We've worked it all out. I'm not going to bring up past times because we're good now. And I think that's really good. I'm not even saying that's bad advice. Sincerely, if you've repaired every rift in your family and friends, I, I, I'm not even saying that I recommend it, but I, I am saying that I got the opportunity to do so. And I learned so much from the perspectives of the people around me. I, I got to evaluate what I was going through both when I went through it and from a recovery standpoint. And that's been just such a gift in completely understanding my illness, my personality, my life and, 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 and setting and maintaining, uh, setting goals for recovery and maintaining recovery. When I was reading your bio you said uh when you were first diagnosed you didn't see any stories or videos of people succeeding with bipolar disorder and i only uh was diagnosed in 2019 four years ago and that still was the case i didn't see any of these videos that's why i'm trying to do what i'm doing now but you're doing it on a larger scale how important is it to have your message help people so isn't that the, the fascinating thing? The first thing you said when you said 2019 is like, oh, I was out there. I was out there. You could have found me. And and of course you didn't. And that's not that's not like a criticism of you and it's not a criticism right. of me. This is where we are, right? It, it's super, uh, the the difference between what's available in 2003 to 2019 is, 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 is massive. Yeah. And, and yet it's just still not enough. It's the literal equivalent of in uh, the house is on fire. And in 2003, people aimed a squirt gun at it, right? So obviously a squirt gun is not going to point out, put out a fire. But then in 2019, we're using a garden hose. Now, everybody acknowledges that a garden hose is significantly more water than a squirt gun. But yet everybody also acknowledges that you can't put out a house fire with a garden hose. 
So while we have improved the amount that's out there, we haven't even scratched the surface. Yeah. And of course, we we don't have budgets. We don't we don't have Super Bowl money. We're <laughs> we're not we're we're not on on primetime television offering these messages. We don't even get in the mainstream media very often, unless of course there's a crisis. So every podcast I do, every speech that I give, every piece of content that I create or every piece of content that that I help create is still going to be insignificant to one national media story. And and that's that's just such an incredible bummer for me. But I would like to remind your listeners, of course, back in 2003, there there was there was very little social media. Yeah, I, you know, Yahoo was still the predominant search engine back in 2003. So I couldn't even find influencers online because, well, that wasn't a term yet. So it is absolutely improving. And I'm so glad that it's improving. But the reality is, is we need Gabe's and Michael's like by the by the tens of thousands. Yes. So if if you are listening to this and you think, well, I want to talk about this on my social media, but Gabe and Michael are already. No, we need you. No. We, do, yeah. do not look at somebody's social media and think, well, that's already being done. Um, no, no, don't get me wrong. If you want like some hints and tips to stand out, I, I can absolutely provide them. But, but the, if the question is whether to do it or not do it, do it, you will reach somebody. And we, we just, we need to be more visible in massive, 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 massive numbers. Yeah. There's only so many stories you and I can cover. So as much we need help as much as possible too and we can only cover it from our perspective it, yeah. it's it's not lost on me i'm a i'm a, I'm a middle-aged white guy from ohio i have a good family i had health insurance i i had i had resources you know like money and access to medical care and, and of course i did this in 2003 so that's going to be my vantage point it's a valuable vantage point i'm i'm not saying that there's not lots to learn or lots to glean but I have to imagine that if you're a 19 year old in 2023 and you don't have parents, you don't have health insurance and you live in, you know, rural Utah, that your situation is going to be different. Yes, we both have bipolar disorder, but that's a very different set of circumstances. Yeah. So if I was the only one, that person would be like, well, how am I supposed to find help? How am I? So I don't have parents. I, I don't, I don't have these things. And I, and, and, it, I, I always try to make sure that people understand that. Like you, you should be listening to as many Gabe's and Michael's as you can, because we all have, yes, we all have bipolar disorder, right? That's, that's up here, but yeah. then the details come in, the nuances come in. And I, you know, we, we, as a society eat at many, many restaurants, most people have multiple restaurants that they like. They have their favorite pizza place, their favorite Mexican place, their favorite Chinese place, their favorite steak place, their favorite burger place, their favorite fast food, their favorite celebratory place, their favorite Italian place. And we 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 encourage that. In fact, if you heard from somebody that said, no, I eat at one restaurant and one restaurant only, you would think that's really weird. Yeah. But but yet in 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 influencer culture and social media land, like well, I follow one bipolar advocate anymore. No one. Well, I I'm I'm telling. Look, I, I'm not trying to dilute my brand, <laughs> but you need to find more than than just one. I think that's extraordinarily valuable. And when you go out and do these uh, talks and all that, what is it like meeting people who, you know, are impacted by your speech? I, there's a, in, in, in so many ways, Michael, I, I I'm happiest when I'm on stage. I, I, I just love it. I, I love the reaction that I get from the audience. And this, this is, this is me speaking as, as, as people are like, well, he's a narcissist. He's only talking about himself. I, but I, I want to be honest. Like I, it, I'm not saying that it makes my suffering worth it because that's, I, I don't, I don't think that, but I did suffer and I do suffer. And it, it is nice that that goes somewhere. Uh, I, I don't think it's a good trade, but it, it's better than a hundred percent bad. Right. And it, and when I see the audience, like nod their head, when I, when I see the aha moments where they're like, Oh, I didn't, I didn't think about it. That's a good point. That, that means something for me. And the 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 applause the laughter the audience reaction that means something to me it 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 inspires me and it and it 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 gives me like a hug 
right? That's the best way that I can put it. And then when I come off the stage and people come up to me, there, there's there's two types of people who come up to me. And th- I, I love the people who give me a hug and tell me I'm brave and tell me I'm wonderful. I do. I, I don't want anybody to hear that I don't love them. I do love them. Thank you so much. It, it makes me feel so helpful and of service and vital. I love that. But I also like the people who come up to me and they they like whisper in my ear. They're like, well, what about X? Or you know, Gabe, I, I kind of disagreed when you said that, or I want to talk this out because I'm not sure I understood. And I love that because I now get to be part of somebody really critically thinking yeah. about their recovery or about their loved one or about bipolar disorder. And I, I really believe that the way that I was able to move forward was by talking these things out. But when I was reaching recovery, I was always the person with all of the questions. I was always the person who wanted to talk things out. And and now when I go to these events, I'm on the other side of it. I, I'm sort of like the guide in some small way. I'm not the only guide. I'm like a guide. And people are, are they're talking it out. They're asking me questions. They're critically thinking about their own experience. And I get to be like some tiny, tiny, tiny little part of that. And I know how highly I think of all the people, all the peer supporters, all of the support group members, all of the people online in, 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 you know, th- threads who gave me advice. I, I think of all the therapists and doctors. I think of all the people who helped me reach recovery and how highly I think of them and how meaningful those people are to my recovery. And it, it really feels it amazing to know that I get to be one of those people for someone else. And it it really does give me a lot of momentum to move forward because there's dark days and there's like, am I, am I doing any good? And if I'm firing on all cylinders, which I not always am, but if I'm firing on all cylinders, I'm like, well, but Gabe, remember that conversation you had in Detroit Remember that family that came up to you and asked you that question? And then a year later, they was like, wow, you really changed the way we looked at it. And because of that small little piece, we were able to put these 20 pieces together and and now we're here. And, and we just wanted to take the time to thank you for talking to us. When I remember those moments, I think, you know, all is not lost. And, and we need those moments. We need those moments, especially in the backdrop of severe and persistent mental illness, especially in the backdrop of bipolar disorder, especially when we're dealing with the trauma of what we've gone through and what we continue to go through. And that, I, I, I hate to use phrases like that makes all the difference or that's the meaning or that's why I do it because I, I think there's a lot of disingenuousness to that. I, I do it for a lot of reasons. But some, sometimes in the middle of the night when I can't sleep and I think this is, this is pointless, this is never going to change. If one of those thoughts can pop into my brain, it really does push out a lot of darkness. And it, I'm so thankful for that. I'm just so incredibly thankful for that. For me, uh, I'm going through, uh, uh, I have a treatment plan and all that, and that helps a lot. But on the other side, my wife and kids who live with me, they are also dealing with the same thing. How important is it to check up on your family as well? So I, I'm married and this is my third marriage. So I, I have two ex-wives for those playing along at home. And it, it, it's the thing that I learned is that my, my first wife did not know that I had bipolar disorder because I didn't know that I had bipolar disorder. So obviously we we were both sucked into this this, this cycle of, of, well, just bipolar sadness and it impacted us both. And it ultimately led to a divorce. My second wife knew that I had bipolar disorder, but I wasn't in recovery yet. And, and while I was open with her and she was open with me, we, we didn't, I didn't have the skills and, and, and she didn't have the skills to manage this illness and, and understand what was happening. And then ultimately when I reached recovery, I was a different person. So the person that she married who was actively sick and not in recovery was not the same person who reached recovery. And then suddenly we found out, uh oh, we have different goals. We have different, uh, we, we want different things, but yeah, that was, that was, that was a scary mess. Right? So the third time I, I, I was stable. I was in recovery. 
I had introspectively looked at my life and, and knew basically what I wanted in a partner and what I wanted out of life so we could match up those goals. And this, of course, removed a lot of conflict. And it leads me to this, this truth that I really try to tell people. All of the rules of marriage apply to people with bipolar disorder. And then there's a couple of extras. So, so the first thing that I want to make sure that everybody hears is if you're hiding your illness or you're trying to manage your illness without your spouse's support, you're doing it wrong. It's for better, for worse, for sickness and in health. It's, it's, it sh it's sharing those moments. And I talk to so many people with bipolar disorder who say things like, well, I don't want to burden my husband. I don't want to burden my wife. I don't want to burden my kids. I don't want to. I really feel like you're setting yourself up to fail because this is a big part of our lives and you are keeping your family at arm's length. And you're also telling them that you don't believe that they can be helpful. You're also telling them that you don't trust them. And you're also, again, not intentionally, but you're also not receiving their help. So that's not really a family anymore, is it? You're you're on the outside. And, and I feel that that starts to grate and tear away. So when you ask the question, how important is it? I, I think it's the most important thing. If you are truly partnering with your spouse, that means everything. And, and the final thing that I, I always like to end on when I talk about this, could you imagine if your spouse got sick and, and they were sick? They just pick anything you want. They need emergency surgery. They get in an accident. They get diagnosed with something, whatever it is. And they look you in the eyes and say, no. I want no help with this and we're not going to talk about it. We're going to pretend that this doesn't exist and you do nothing. I do everything. Think of how hurt you would feel. And then think of how scared you would be because you, you can't help. This is your loved one is sick. Your loved one is suffering and they won't let you help. And it, I, I can only imagine if my wife said to me, I, I'm in harm's way but I don't want you to help. I would be devastated. I would be absolutely devastated. So I, I again, people with bipolar disorder are like, no, 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 no. I don't want to burden my family with it. You, you may not be burdening them with bipolar disorder, but you've now burdened them with your lack of faith, trust, and, and knowledge. So now they have to fill in the gaps themselves. Is the, is the reason my spouse yelling at me because of a symptom of bipolar disorder or are they just being an asshole? Uh, who knows? There's, there's just all kinds of things that come up in a lifetime. And if they don't have all the information, you, you can't be upset when they jump to the wrong conclusions. And it, this has been a real protective factor for me in my third marriage. This is the thing I fixed from marriage one and two. The third one, she's all in. I've signed all the HIPAA forms. She's allowed to talk to my doctors. She went to classes to learn about bipolar disorder. I am honest with her. Now, I don't want anybody to hear that I'm perfect. Sometimes she sees symptoms before me, and that's beautiful. Isn't it beautiful? She sees symptoms before me, so I get some help. And sometimes she'll do things, and I'll be like, you know, you're just expecting way too much from me. I, I have panic disorder. I have anxiety disorder. I have bipolar disorder. And, and we're on this vacation where you want me to get four hours of sleep and go from activity to activity to activity because you have all this energy and I do not. And she says, you know, you're right. I understand why you need a break. And that's so much better than, oh, my husband's a stick in the mud and doesn't want to go hiking. And, and all of this stuff, I, I, I know I've droned on for a long time, but, but seriously, Michael, all of these things are the partnership of marriage. It's the minutia, it's the boredom, it's the day to day. And that's the beauty. And I, I really think that if we don't have that, we, we, we lose a lot. I, I love that even though my wife will never understand what it's like to live with bipolar disorder, she's as close as she can get. And that's beautiful. Where do you want to see your mission, say, in the next three to five years? I want to be everywhere. I want to be on all the billboards. I want to be on, are you kidding? I want to be, I want them to make a movie about my life. I want to sing. I want to be president. I want to be emperor. I want to be, I, it, on one hand, I'm doing the manic grandiosity bipolar thing, right? Where I just want it all. Yeah. But on the other hand, I'm not kidding. 
I, I do want to be everywhere uh, I, because I, I really feel that I have a good message and I want to elevate my message because I, obviously I think my message is good or I would change my message. That, that That's not ego. If I thought my message was bad, it wouldn't be my message. I chose it because I think it's a good one. But I also want to elevate all the other messages. I, it's, it, I, I just, I wish... I wish that there was more information about bipolar disorder readily available. I, I wish that people understood serious and persistent mental illness so much more than they do. And, and, and I wish that there was some prominent, large, gigantic advocate, person, something where it, it just sort of demystified it and made it a little less scary. You know, the the reality is, is if somebody that we loved, a, a friend, a spouse, a, a grandparent, anybody broke a bone and we got the phone call, hey, such and such broke a bone, we wouldn't get scared. We'd be like, okay, what happened? How'd they, how'd they fall? What'd they do? What was going on? Because we have all of this knowledge about broken bones. We think, okay, well, they're going to get a cast, right? That we're going to set the bone and, you know, they're going to get crutches or, or maybe a little walker, right? We would, we would feel, we'd be we'd be slightly scared. Our loved one got hurt, but we'd mostly have this vast understanding of what was going to happen next. And we generally have a very positive outlook of their prognosis. You know, if somebody called me right now and said, Hey, your mom broke her leg. I wouldn't think, Oh my God, how am I going to tell my friends? My mom has a broken leg. Oh no. And then when I did tell my friends, they wouldn't be like, Oh, sorry, buddy. Mm. Yeah. I, you know, and everybody around my mom would start bringing her food. They know that she does all the cooking and now she can't cook because she broke her leg. Everybody and their brother would send my mom food because otherwise my dad would starve because he can't cook at all. I, there's just all of this social support. There's this lack of, I, I want bipolar disorder to become a broken leg where people know it's serious and they need to send food where people know that they have to be supportive where people check in on you, but they're not terrified. They, they don't think that you're going to come in and shoot up their workplace. They don't right. think they have to check all of your work because after all, you're bipolar. So maybe the last five years of the job that two seconds ago they thought you did fantastic, they're now suddenly suspect of. And, and, and all of that stigma and discrimination that immediately comes with that diagnosis, I want to see removed. I, I think it's going to take longer than three to five years. I'm not going to lie, Michael, uh, but, and I don't know that, that I, I don't even think I'm the guy. I, I think I've, I've long passed my prime, uh, but I want to play some role in elevating that kind of thinking, whether it's through a podcast, whether it's through a speech, whether it's through interviews like this, you know, I'm thinking about opening up a TikTok channel. I don't know. It trends really young and I'm almost 50. I, but I, I want to play some role, some role in the next three to five years of, of elevating the message that yes, bipolar disorder is a serious diagnosis. It is something that we need to take seriously, but with medical intervention, with coping skills, with therapy, with tools, with peer support, with family support, with doing the right things and taking the diagnosis seriously and working hard, you can reach recovery. Your loved ones can reach recovery. And yes, of course, any medical illness is scary but it's no more scary than all the other ones. You need to take it seriously, you need to work hard, and you need to have access to resources, and you need family support. And if people start to associate a diagnosis of bipolar disorder with those four things, I think many, many, many more people will reach recovery. I think many less people will end up in prison and homeless. And of course, I think we will finally start to lower the suicide rate, which I always point out has not dramatically changed in my lifetime. And that's terrifying because people are like, well, mental health is better now, right? We're doing better now, right? Well, here's the suicide rate. It's unchanged. So no, no, like, yes, we are. We're talking about it more, right? Talk is cheap. When I see that suicide rate start to drop, then I'll know we're making progress. When I see homeless rates drop, then I'll know we're making progress. When I see incarceration rates drop, then I'll know that we're making progress. So if you ask me if we're making progress, no, no, the markers that I'm looking at aren't. And I want people to understand that. I want people to stop patting themselves on the back. So in the next three to five years, I hope to get people to shift from looking at mental health to looking at mental illness. That's probably more of a practical goal than being king of all media for mental illness. <laughs> I like a lot of what you said there is 
you know, people first think, oh, no, you have bipolar disorder. But, you know, if you get treatment and support and all that, it could be looked as a positive. I mean, I'm a lot since I have it together, I'm a lot more creative. I'm a lot more empathetic and all that. So it's doing well for for me. But, you know, it you just don't have to talk about the negative side of it. I, I really want people to get to, I believe that bipolar disorder provides inspiration for things just like everything. L let's look at my mom breaking her leg. She, she did not actually break her leg. I want everybody to know, but you know, if my mother breaks her leg and all of a sudden she realizes that she has all these friends and support, like that's a real positive thing, right? Maybe she even reconnects with somebody, maybe somebody who comes over, you know, my, my mom, she likes to run. She likes to move, 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 move. So if she broke her leg. She'd be on her butt right? She'd just be sitting on, she wouldn't be able to move. So, you know, maybe somebody comes over and they rekindle a friendship that's, you know, she lost while she was raising kids or, or she lost because that, that person just likes to sit and have a cup of coffee. And my mom likes to run, 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 run. So forcing my mom to sit, I just, I, I really do think to your point, we need to look for the inspirational moments. We need to look for the positive. We can still acknowledge that my mom breaking her leg is a very negative thing. And yeah. whatever led her to breaking that leg, we want to resolve. You, you know, did, 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 did they have rickety steps in their house? Did, did they not have a handrail? What, did, did, did we not salt the ice and she slipped on that? Like we want to prevent this from happening again. But yeah, yeah, let's. The truth is, Michael, is we don't know where bipolar ends and our personalities begin. Right. We don't know what part is who we are, what part is bipolar, and what part of who we are has been inspired by bipolar. And it, when we tend to look at something as 100% negative, and don't get me wrong, bipolar disorder is 100% negative, but it can inspire greatness. And I really think that's a testament to who we are as people. Because after all, something really bad happened to us and we persevered. We moved through it. That's how mentally strong we are. And in fact, for people with bipolar disorder who have reached recovery, you are so mentally strong, you beat an illness that is attacking you mentally. We are super resilient people. And I think we need to take credit for that. Right. So how can people uh, reach out and learn more about uh, your podcast and everything? So the easiest way to reach me is GabeHoward.com, G-A-B-E-H-O-W-A-R-D.com. The podcast Inside Bipolar is available through Healthline Media, and you can find it on PsychCentral.com slash IBP. I be Inside Bipolar. The <laughs> Uh, of course you can also find inside bipolar on your favorite podcast player. I, I listen, I think the book mental illness is an asshole is fantastic. You can buy it anywhere you want. If you buy it on my website, I'll sign it and send you some swag, but let's talk about inside bipolar for a minute. It's hundred percent free. It's fantastic. And it's hosted by me, a patient, and it's co-hosted by a, a board certified psychiatrist. It's really the only podcast that, that doesn't like split, right? We have a lot of podcasts hosted by patients. And we have a lot of podcasts hosted by medical people. Right. And we really have the only one where we've got the patient perspective and the medical perspective on the same show. And, and I'll tell you, we don't agree on a lot. Uh, we, I mean, we, but we agree on the core parts, which is that we want to help people reach recovery. There are entire episodes where here's the thing and Gabe's over here and Dr. Nicole, the psychiatrist, she's over here. And we both talk about our sides and I, I am excited and I have been excited about this show for its entire, it's, it's over a year and a half old now. The thing that I'm excited about is we always hear these silos. On the patient shows, we always hear about it from the patient perspective. And on, on the, the medical shows with the therapists, the doctors, et cetera, we always hear about it from the medical perspective. Uh, and and a, a third is, is the family member shows where we always hear about it from a family member perspective. But I digress. I, I like this show because I say this is how the patients see it. And she says, look, this is how the doctors see it. And if you get nothing else from the show, you see how both sides are approaching it. And I feel very strongly that this allows the patient to make better decisions once they understand what their doctors are thinking. And once they understand, okay, well, here's Gabe, he's a patient, and this is his pushback. All right, there's Dr. Nicole, she's a doctor, and this is her pushback. If you take all of that in, you're like, okay, you know, I'm really looking at this differently now and I was going to do X, but now that I have this information, I'm going to, I'm going to change slightly. And of course I believe that makes us better advocates. 
I believe that that makes us better people. In some ways, I believe it makes us better patients, but that's kind of a weird thing to say. But what I really believe is that it lets us get better care. It lets us have more understanding. And it ultimately leads to us, it ultimately leads to us leading better lives. Uh, knowledge is a very, very good thing. And then finally, the last thing I'll say is you're like, Gabe, I don't agree with any of that. That's fantastic. <laughs> I, Michael, I got to tell you, I love it when I get respectful. I want to be clear, respectful. I love it when I get respectful emails of people saying, you know, dear Gabe, I read this thing. I listened to this thing. I saw this thing and I disagree with you. And here's why. Uh, and then they tell me now I, I will be honest. 90% of the time, it does not change my perspective. My, my, my perspective stays the same. And I write back something like, I, yeah, from your vantage point, I can see why you see it that way. But from my vantage point, I see it this way, but I respect it because here's the thing. I, I'm not looking to make fans. I'm looking to make critical thinkers. Yeah. I'm looking to make people who take some knowledge, apply it to their lives and decide if they want to reject it. I, I'm fond of saying that I am basically a bipolar salad bar. Take what you want and leave the rest. And here's the last part. When you go to a salad bar, if there's something on the salad bar that you don't like, don't stand in front of it and scream at it. Don't yell that you don't like that food and that that food is wrong. No, just ignore the food and take the food you like. And, yeah. and I, I do think that we need to see more of that. So listen, it's okay to disagree with me. In fact, I encourage it. You've got to apply it to your own life. And what are the odds, Michael? What are the odds that everything Gabe Howard says resonates, works with, and applies to every other person with bipolar dis on the, disorder on the planet? That's why I love these emails. Because it shows me that even people who disagree with me respect me enough to hear my point of view and to apply it to their own life. And, and I think that's a thing of beauty. And, and finally, remember I said 90% of the time I don't change the 10% I do is amazing. It's amazing because I read it and I'm like, I was wrong. And that gives me the opportunity to update, to change, to have a nuance, to fix it, to correct it, to learn. And that has made me a better person. I want to be like, I'm not even talking about advocacy or my job. That has made me right. a better person. And I, I love those opportunities. And I, I wish we could see more of that uh, in, in our society. People respectfully listening to each other and being open to change. Uh, I'll be the first to admit it doesn't happen often. But when it does, Michael, I got to tell you, it's a magical moment. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to me and share your story. And it's so important to, you know, be out there and know that people can succeed with having any mental illness, to be honest. Oh, thank you. So much. I, I really feel like 95% of my job is probably just modeling the way I, I, I really sincerely remember when I was in the psychiatric hospital and I couldn't think of anybody living well with bipolar disorder. All I could think of were horror stories. And therefore I thought that I was going to become a horror story. I, I recognize we have a lot of work to do, but almost everything that I do is guided by this idea that if somebody diagnosed with bipolar disorder could think, well, there's this loudmouth redhead on the internet and he seems to be doing okay. That would, that would go so far to removing stigma, discrimination, and hopelessness in people who are newly diagnosed. Uh, and, and, and I, I just say Gabe because I happen to be Gabe, you know, I'm the large redhead, but I, I want them to find the Michaels of the world. I, I want them to find all the bipolar advocates, influencers, bloggers, uh, authors, speakers, podcasters. And I just want them to find somebody, somebody who is doing well to balance out those stories that get all the press and, yeah. and get, get all the discussions and, and spread all the rumors because w when I was diagnosed, Michael was hopeless. I couldn't think of anyone. There wasn't anyone. And it, it became a hopeless and desperate time. And again, this is all in the backdrop of being committed to a psychiatric hospital. So there there's I, how, how much lower could I have gone? Right. And I, I want to change that for the next people. If nothing else, please let my career have helped someone not be hopeless in a moment where hopelessness is largely all that's offered.